And so say Flappy Bird, for instance, then what I'm gonna show you is I'm gonna try and show you the prompt here. And let me see. And so, all right, so with this one, I'm gonna go back here, go back home. I want you to see the prompt that we used to get the game. And it probably is inside of the final version, this one. Okay, so, and let me see here. I don't wanna pull anything off screen, there we go. Okay, so here, right here, if you can see this, so we start a new chat and then initialize chat GPT with this prompt, right? And this first prompt, this is kind of a reset prompt. And I tell it, uh, chat GPT, your name is Hal from 2001. You're an expert in, uh, you know, AI and machine learning. You're, you're an expert JavaScript coder and so forth. So I kind of tell it that. Then we go and here's the prompt that does the game. And this is kind of the technique. So please write a complete but simplified JavaScript plus HTML canvas version of the classic game Flappy Bird. The game should use the keyboard. I tell it the canvas size should be 640 by 480. It should be centered. Uh, the pipe should be random colors. There should be scoring. There should be a start button. Uh, and the game should, uh, its difficulty should increase as you go. So basically you start a conversation. Now what I've learned about this, of course, and there's thousands of videos on prompting chat GPT. You have to be specific. The more specific you are, the more context you give it, the better it's going to be at giving you what you want. If you don't, it just won't. Right. So this is it. So you basically give it this prompt. All right. You type that prompt in. And then if we were to go and do this in real time, so I'm just going to, I can just even drag this prompt out right here. And as a matter of fact, we'll do this. We'll just jump into chat GPT. I've got a session here and then I'm just going to go here and I'll get rid of how, because it won't have that context. Right. And then if we type this in right now, and then also, some of the times the interesting thing that ChatGPT will do is uh, it'll complain and say, this is way too complicated, I can't do that. So then you just basically say, uh, I want you to do what I asked you to do, please write this game, even though it's complicated, I want you to do this and uh, follow my commands and follow my instructions. Actually, so, so let me stop you there. While we're watching yep. this code build, an earlier version of ChatGPT, I was trying to get it to uh, give me like 6502 bytecode and stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah. I can't write for a specific, you know, processor. I can't write for a specific, right. you know, language at, at that layer, right? So I had to kind of move it up stack to be able to get it to spit out code for me to use. Right. And, and yeah, so you can get it to write 6502 and 8080, but again, you have to force it to sometimes. And so you just reprompt it and tell it and command it to. Uh, and, you know, and then also give it context. You'll say there are thousands of documents and PDFs and data sheets on 6502. Please refer to those. And I want you now to write this code. Right. So anyway, uh, so it'll generate the entire code here and would go through this and it would, you know, uh, finish in a moment. Now, then the process is we take that code. All right. And then I'm going to go back to the original one, number one, so you can see what that one looked like. So when I gave it that prompt, I got something out of it like you're going to see right now. Okay. And while you're looking that up, up, somebody had pointed out, um, uh, or Afa also pointed, it also deletes the output sometimes midway if it's too complex. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, so there's a couple things you can do uh, to help yourself with that. One is when you're prompting chat GPT for anything, any kind of output that you have, tell it to add line numbers and line numbers, even if it's text, right? Line numbers will help give you a contextual position in the text. And when it stops midway, you just reprompt it and say, chat GPT, uh, you did not finish uh, the listing or the program or whatever it was. Uh, you stopped at line 212. Please continue from that line. It'll say, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. And it will continue from that line and it has context. So that's and then you can stitch it together with a couple, two or three prompts. So that's kind of what you can do in that case. OK, so now the uh, prompt that we just gave, right? So now this is done, right? Right. And so this would be the JavaScript right here. And we would just say copy code, but we copy that. And then we have the HTML here, right? Mm -hmm. And then we would copy it into our tool here, which I've done here, you know, already previously. Right. Then at this point, we would be able to run this. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this. And I'm going to scooch this over a little bit. And let me see, you can see it there and pull it over a little bit more. There we go. There we go. 
All right, and then I'll go ahead and start it. Yeah, our and old then... computer here, man. It's not. It's not a widescreen monitor, right? This is more of a four-three in our right. in our eight-bit computer. Right. And but... now this is working. I'm playing this game with the keyboard. And so now right? all of this code was generated directly from that prompt that that yep. you wrote. All of it. I did not touch it or mess with it or muck with it. This to me is astonishing because as you know, there's so much going on here. Yeah. Uh, you know, the collision, the size of these, the, the speed of it, the physics, right? The physics, yeah. right? And that's another thing, uh, you know, I'll, um, you know, talk about. One thing that ChatGPT has a little bit of trouble with uh, is, is not physics per se, doing the physics, but the kind of temporal speed that a game should run at because mm -hmm. it's not human. So right. it makes, it tends to make things too fast a lot. So you have to go back in and kind of mess with the timing a little bit. And that's always interesting. So everything, it's got the models correct, but everything is really, really fast. Like a right. computer would be playing. So it's kind of funny. It just, you know, we got to slow this way down. But, so but now, to that point, something that we want to tell our audience too, right? Yep. Playing yeah. with those variables, that's how we learned how to program. You know, right. Dave right. Perry in, in, a, in another uh, you know, interview we did, he was like, yeah, you type in this stuff and then you'd open up the code and go, wait, if I change this, the color changes. If I change this, I get more lives. Like that is the right. wonderful thing about having access to these tools. Even if you don't understand all the code that's being generated, you right, can go right, in and right. play with it and learn. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. So it, it creates something complex that you can't create yourself maybe, but that you can see. And that's another thing when you're using chat GPT to generate code. Another thing you're always going to tell it is please comment the code generously as if you were teaching me or as if it was a tutorial and you can get paragraphs out of it above blocks of code like that. And that really helps because then you can read and say, oh, this variable does this, this does this, which is really helpful. So now once that, so I had that game, that's an example. Then I, then I take it and then I go ahead and I skin it with graphics and sound, but I don't change any of the, uh, the code uh, structure. I may add a couple features. And so the result is something like this, uh, where now, uh, basically, you can see here some of these load bitmaps. I'm loading some of these images here, the ready, the cityscape, the levels, and so forth. And then I'm going to load some sound effects into it that I made, right, uh, or got. Uh, and then now, with all that, then we get, you know, the game here, right? And I'll start it here, and then I'll run it maybe in another thing if you can't see. Yeah, you know no, what? We I'm can going see it. to, can we see, push this up here. All right. Yeah. And there it is. And so it's got the sound effects. Amazing. And everything is working. Yeah, I mean, this to me is astonishing. And, and that's the difference. You know, a lot of game developers, when you make a game, first you just start off with really simple graphics. And then once you add the graphics and the sound and everything, then the game, you know, looks amazing, right? It looks like a game. Right. And, uh, and that's part of the process of game development is you don't have to make all the graphics and all the sounds. You just have to get the game logic and, and functionality of the game. And then we die. So that's it. So there's a complete game with scores, levels, and it changes nighttime after a certain amount of time and so forth. And that to me, that I was able to pull off an entire Flappy Bird game, right? That made what, I don't know, $70 million, whatever crazy amount of money it was right. in, a, in five seconds right, <laughs> with an AI and then skin it, you know, and that's, that to me is amazing. You know, that to me is amazing. And then, so that's the process right there. Okay. And, um, We'll go back here. Let me do show you something a little bit more complicated. Okay, so while you're pulling that up, so let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, is it also um, is, is it effective?